whatever it is that's the hot topic of the moment oh man i appreciate that you know we've been doing podcasts for a very long time yourself and myself so uh it's mm-hmm. great to hear that you actually you actually still enjoy what we do absolutely um but yeah it, it's, it's been a while since you had you on so i think we're just gonna run through the, the watershed of stuff you know there's a lot we'll probably touch on some wrestling stuff um uh, some nerd stuff and uh you know based on going on like even though it is january it's crazy that like it is so packed you know there's so much going on where you're like okay uh where do we start and i think the most pressing way to start is what we're talking about just before we went live i've actually gotten to video games again which is surprising you know uh i mm. think it's funny because this week catherine was just re-released i think one of the first things we talked about in great detail was catherine a couple of years ago yeah it's funny how these things come back around again isn't it it's crazy it's crazy i was just like well it's almost like they know <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, they set their watch by what we talk about i think i think so i think so but uh, i was playing a lot of uh, mortal kombat xl you know xl is but uh, <laughs> they set their watch by what we talk about i think i think so i think so but uh, i was playing a lot of uh, mortal kombat xl you know xl is mortal kombat 10 but with the with the extra characters in it Mm. Playing a lot of that last night. Anyone who was following the Twitch stream, Nerd Ducks, um, it, it will see that I kind of pre- I played half the game last night, and um, yeah, man, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I just sat there and I was just like, I did not think I was going to enjoy this as much as I did, but it's actually fantastic. Yeah, like I, I'm, I, I, I do like what Neverrealm have done with Mortal Kombat. Um, I, my, my first exposure to their uh, engine actually was playing um, the. The DC game, um, what was it? Oh, I can't remember the it name of it now. Um, you know, it's, it's like an Elseworlds where Superman's gone evil and he yeah. kills the Joker because he murdered Lois Lane. And um, oh god, um, Gods Among Us. Uh, oh, I cannot remember the name of that blooming game. Injustice. But anyway, <laughs> it just yeah. yeah. Sorry, I couldn't. I, I didn't hear you there. Um, so yeah, um, Injustice was the the first time that I'd I'd played that. Um, that engine yeah. and then uh i i played mortal kombat 10 uh eventually as well on playstation and it's just so much fun to play mm. and the way that they've got it set up with how the story progresses and how it really forces you into using characters that you wouldn't have even touched otherwise exactly and yeah. yeah i love that i think it's a really interesting way of telling a fighting game story because you know, I, I we we may get on to the, the the classics like the original Mortal Kombat and stuff when Retro Pie become becomes a subject of conversation at some point. <laughs> but um, I, as much as I enjoy the old games where you just pick a character and you just run the way all the way through all of the other, other characters, uh, you know, like a like a tower, um, I get a lot more out of a game where there is some sort of story being told, and that's what Neverrun were doing with Mortal Kombat. And uh, what they do with injustice as well. Yeah, I I agree exactly. Like the first time, like I kind of I was always a Mortal Kombat fan as such. But mm. when I really got back into the Mortal Mortal Kombat series and the engine, like actively, it was when DC versus Mortal Kombat came out a couple of years ago. Mm. And yeah. then they did the relaunch um, of Mortal Kombat Mortal Kombat Nine, which was kind of like a, pretty much a remake of the first one. I know mm-hmm. Mortal Kombat 10 is like a brand new story, but it did kind of work in that, okay, you start off with, you know, X, Y, and Z characters. So, you know, you, I never would have picked Sonya Blade. I never would have picked, you know, um, a lot of these characters. But when you're actually playing them, it does make you make you have to get good, but also follow the story. So it's you're, it's a much more active play rather than, your brain being turned off and you're just going through all these characters but what i really like about what nether netherrealm have done is they've they've kind of internalized a lot of the comments and a lot of the negative stuff particularly around the ps2 era which mm-hmm. um you know i like daddy lions i thought it was great but a few of the others were a bit hit or miss so playing this game uh i I've had a great time with it. Like I literally, I sat down and played half the game in a night. So I'll probably finish the rest of it tonight. But um, if anyone hasn't played Mortal Kombat X, pick up XL because it comes with you know Letterface, 
um, Freddy's not in it, but Jason is. The alien mm-hmm. who actually, like the xenomorph alien. Funny kind of palette swap. So if you pick Jax, you actually get Carol Weathers. Oh, nice. Which okay. Because cool, the Predator's also in it. And it's like, well, you know, the, the actual depths of uh, yeah. characters that uh, you get in this is great. That's awesome. That's awesome. And it really timely that you were playing it as well with Mortal Kombat 11 around the corner. Um, oh, yeah. They well, revealed the, the artwork. I think yesterday or the day before yesterday. Man, I have to say, look, look, I'm really excited about Mortal Kombat, but the one thing that really threw me off, I don't know, have you seen the original trailer? Was... Uh, no, I don't think I have, actually. Okay. I've, I've seen the, um, the, the the artwork for the poster, and that was pretty much it. I saw a load of uh, people excited for it. Yeah, like, the there was actually, uh, like a, not a game tra- trail player, but it was like a, a fight between Raiden and Scorpion. And mm. like from an artwork perspective, from a physics perspective, from an actual graphics perspective, it looks awesome. But the weird thing about it is the music choice is very weird. It's just weird rap music that they're using. And it oh, just, really? It just kills, kills mm. the atmosphere completely. It's really weird. And here's an here's an experiment for everybody listening. Pull up, um, Immortal by um, Adama. They did the soundtrack for Deadly Alliance. And just have the music playing over the over that uh, that uh, video, it actually makes it so much better. Mm. And it's, yeah, it, it, it's crazy that music has that impact on things. But I don't know why they went with the rap music. It just really, <laughs> it really doesn't. Like I know some people like rap, I personally don't. But it just really has no tension in it. It's just really weird. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it works for some games, but not for uh, Mortal Kombat. Not for a fighting game. Even Dubstep um, worked way better. You know, uh, or you know, uh, in Mortal Kombat mm. Nine with uh, Reptile, that was awesome. Mm. <laughs> he, he strikes me as the kind of guy that would uh, listen to a lot of Dubstep anyway. So I guess it's fitting. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, the more coding I do, the more the more eclectic and electronic my music taste gets. But Dubstep's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah man I'd say look if anyone hasn't played it give it a shot I think everybody will be really pleased with what's there and um, I love it so you know happy days right well I w- kind of want to shift gears here a bit and talk about the MCU with you because we haven't talked in ages I think we've missed out most of the MCU um, sure. <laughs> what, what, what's your opinion on it? Are, are you off the boat yet or are you still there oh I'm still on the boat I'm still very much on the boat um I'm not I'm finding it more difficult to get through the Netflix TV series um right because of the fact that I know that uh, like I I I'm late to everything by a matter of days or weeks and by the time that I was ready to start watching the this uh, last year's intake of of Marvel TV shows they'd already all been cancelled and I was like well there's no rush on getting around to them then um and I did eventually watch them and actually I greatly enjoyed them uh, I was disappointed with the way that uh, they, they ended Luke Cage because I felt like that was a story that needed a better ending than the one it got. But uh, as far as the films are concerned, um, they've still got me on board. Like I think Infinity War was a really well executed uh, movie, which, you know, when you think of the sheer scale, the number of different characters and stories that you're trying to draw together um, and the fact that they managed to pull it off and with maybe one or two exa- uh, like it felt like everybody got the amount of attention that they needed and um yeah it was if nothing else there was a joke about battered mars bars which or battered pizza or something in in the beginning of the film which just kind of set me up for the rest of the movie i was like okay yeah that's cool that's cool um uh, but yeah i'm i'm looking forward to um endgame um I, i'll see where i am after endgame as to whether i'm then off the boat because I, it could just be a case of that's a good jumping off point i was very similar with the walking dead where yeah. i got to the end of the oh sorry gary no no I, that's actually a very good comparison uh, a lot of people had that with the walking Dead as well where it's like okay i'm kind of done now i've had enough of this exactly uh, i i got to the end of actually it wasn't even the end of the negan arc um in, in the TV show, but certainly with the comics, I, I got to the end of Negan and I was like, this, this is good. I'm done. And I stopped reading it. Uh, and I didn't even wait until the Negan run was over on the TV show before I stopped watching that because I knew where it was going. Mm. I basically got to Glenn and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> this is me. I'm sorted. Uh, but yeah, like this is the thing. 
I will probably carry on watching the uh, the MCU movies because they've garnered so much goodwill from me that I have no reason to stop watching them. Right. But I wonder at what point I'm going to turn around and think to myself, hang on, am I hate watching these now? Or are they still really good? Um, I think it will take a while, though. How about you? Like, Are you still on board with them? Or have you started to drift away a little bit? No, like, I'll be honest. I, I thoroughly enjoy the cinema experience, right? So even if the movies are bad, I'd still go see them. Because mm. um, I kind of do that with the the DC Cinematic Universe. But I do that with the, the DC Cinematic Universe. But as far as my hype, yeah, like, I'm excited to see Endgame. I thought Infinity War is really good. Um, I love the new Spider-Man. Um, I think there's a lot of... A lot of good future there. However, seeing a lot of the the outside factors now is starting to concern me. Like Captain Marvel has been touted as the most important Marvel uni- movie since Iron Man, and I'm like, all right, like I like Captain Marvel, she's cool, but <laughs> most important, yeah. okay. Um, wh- why not Sentry? I thought, thought Sentry is the most powerful character in the marvel universe but you know whatever um i kind of think like there's a lot of outside factors that are being pushed into the mcu and if that becomes the be all and end all i'm like okay i'm going to kind of take a step back from this um and i'm not even talking about sjw stuff i mean like what you mentioned there about the the netflix series like a lot of the reason that they were cancelled was because of the disney deal with Fox and their new streaming service. So you have Daredevil, which is Netflix's most popular series to date. That's that's going to be cancelled now if it's not already. Like, there won't be a fourth season. Um, and that's all because of Disney's new streaming service, which, obviously, we're going to get Mandalorian, the Star Wars Mandalorian show on. Uh, a lot of these yeah. Netflix series are going to be on it. The Loki Hawkeye series is going to be on it. So I'm like, yeah. all right. We have this great thing. How much is it going to be impacted by outside factors? And once that becomes too great, that's my concern. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I get some kind of confirmation as to what the actual deal entailed. But Netflix being the way they are, they won't tell you how many people watched a show, let alone what their deal is with Disney for making these things. But the most popular opinion that I've seen floating around is that Netflix had at least another couple of years left on the licensing for these characters. Yep. So they could have made another set of series for all of these if they wanted to. Not that all of them needed it, uh, but I definitely think Luke Cage needed another series. I've not finished the latest series of Daredevil yet, so I'm not 100% sure where that leaves it. But I've heard things that make me think that it doesn't finish in a terrible place. Um, like th- There are just... I, I don't understand why Netflix would just throw those licenses away when they have time left on them. I, I unless think, I think, sorry, Dave, go ahead, go for it. Okay, uh, un- unless there was some sort of external pressure, as you were saying with like Disney, but I don't know. I it, Netflix are too good at what they do to leave their shows in limbo the way that these ones have been. So there's got to be something else going on. But I don't know what that is, and it's infuriating. I wish someone would just come out and say, See, honestly. Uh, uh, for, like, I watch uh, Midnight's Edge on YouTube. Mm. Uh, they're fantastic with breaking down this kind of stuff. I totally mm. recommend them. But um, what seems to be the case, and what you know, just judging by how Marvel actually do this, if Netflix kind of held on to them for a long period of time, they would kind of do, in my opinion... Um, you know, based on what they've done with Fantastic Four and the X Men, they would probably start negatively touting them. So, you know, what they did with Fantastic Four and the X Men, probably start negatively touting them. So, you know, what they did with Fantastic Four and the X Men for the past couple of years is they just stopped printing comics. They stopped mm. having up front. They they pushed them down to the point where it's just like, well, we don't own them. So, you know, whatever. And I think that might happen, you know. Yeah, I uh, and I, I see where you're coming from, but I, I think that there's a very different setup going on. Whereas um, you, you talk about like uh, X Men and uh, Fantastic Four, those are characters that are owned by Fox mm. or whoever the hell at the moment. Yeah. Um, whereas Daredevil, Luke Cage, uh, Jessica Jones, uh, Iron Fist, 
they are all leased out to Netflix for a set amount of time, which none of us know. Um, it could be up for all we know, but then why would they? I mean, the, the most infuriating thing for me was that they went from season one of uh, Iron Fist, which was pretty much panned across the board. Mm. I enjoyed it, but I saw a lot of people pan it, and I completely get why they panned it. Yep. Season two came along and was absolutely ridiculously good it teased so much in the final episode and set so much stuff up and then they cancel it like why why would you set that stuff up unless at the time you were all you know all all engines on full for going for a third season so you know i i think that the fact that it's licensed out to netflix rather than sold to them um is a big difference there i don't think that marvel now would make the kind of mistake that they made back when they sold off things like spider-man i mean they're in a much better financial position for a start which yeah. let's remember is why they sold licenses when they sold off things like spider-man i mean they're in a much better financial position for a start which yeah. let's remember is why they sold licenses um to other companies to begin with because they just needed to make money to keep the comics business afloat but see they're in, they're, um, in a, they, they're in a similar deal with spider-man where it's like they've arranged this great deal uh, with Sony, but Sony can kind of pull out at any time. Yeah, but I think Sony understand what side their bread's buttered on that one. I hope so. You know, well, like, see, that's the thing. That's the thing about Venom and Into the Spider Verse, which you know we talked about on the show. We both really liked, but I hope hmm. Sony aren't like, well, look, we can do this now. And it's like, no, you don't understand. That worked because it's completely different to everything you've done before, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, like Spider Man worked because of the fact Homecoming. This is because mm. they actually took advice from Marvel yeah. and did things the Marvel way. Into the Spider Verse worked because they got Lord and Miller involved. Yeah. Let Let's not pretend it wasn't anything to do with them because those guys have this habit of just taking a property that should not work or will not work, and they just rub it up. And with Star Wars aside, because I think they were very harshly treated with the whole solo thing, mm. um, they they turn pig's ears into uh, silk purses. Um, well, yeah, well, actually, not saying in any way, shape, or form that Miles Morales is a pig's ear, because he's not. He's one of the best characters that Marvel have had in the last 20, 30 years. Well, see, it's funny you say that, because it just shows you now how much solo could have been a hit. Mm. You yeah. Know, they could have really taken something. the face. Yeah, it's just like I, I, I didn't hate Solo because I expected. I nothing. it's very good. I, I expected nothing, and it, like it is what it is. But I think they could have taken a very average movie to be something actually good, you know. But yeah, because Marvel is run by somebody with vision, and Disney's run by someone with no vision. So it's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> <And> <laughs> Disney decided that Marvel can carry on doing what they're doing. Yeah. Um, Maybe they should just put Kevin Feige in charge of Disney. Maybe that's the trick. Uh, uh, you know, know what? Even um, what Dave Filoni, the guy who made Clone Wars, mm. get him. He's awesome. Everybody likes Dave Filoni. You know, it's just like yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Clone Wars are coming back. back sorry, Clone Wars are coming back at the beginning of this year as well. So that's also pretty awesome. Mm. I'm looking forward to that. Clone Wars is p good. It's just I don't know. I'm. You know, we've talked a little bit about this, myself and Bryn, we've talked about um, how to stay the Star Wars movie franchise. And it seems mm. it's going to be time travel and, you know, all this kind of <laughs> stuff. And I don't know if you've heard it, but Air Theory is, and for the listeners or people joining the stream, Air Theory is, they should just, you know, have a cold open. Luke is in yep. like a space shower. And, you know, <laughs> Mary Jade wakes up. And she Dallas goes open. in and opens opens it up and she's like, oh, I had this horrible dream, you know, and you weren't there and I was an old grumpy man and there was this woman that could just do everything, Han died, Leia died, oh, and she's like, oh, don't worry about that, you, you know, you have to go meet Kal Katan. and there you go, saved. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like, I, I, Star Wars is a funny one for me because I'm interested to see uh, where they take it with this next film, yeah. um, because it seems like there was no communication between uh, JJ and um, I can't remember the name of the director for the Rean for Johnson. the other film. Who was it? Sorry, Rean Johnson. That's right. Yes. Who was it? Sorry, Rean Johnson. That's right. Yes. Um, didn't seem like there was much communication, if any, there, because Johnson just took a bunch of things that JJ set up and just threw them away. Apparently, um, what happened, Dave, is. 
he had the script written before he saw the last Jedi, the Terry Force Awakens, and then just kind of did what he wanted anyway. <laughs> that's not how you do it. No, <laughs> so that's why he's just like, well, I have a movie, so I want to do uh, my he- movie. Yeah. He- heaven forbid that I say that I miss the days of um, <laughs> of a certain Kermit the Frog sounding filmmaker who had a vision for his movies and at least stuck to it. But uh, George Lucas, we miss you. Um, I don't know. I, I'm i interested to see where it goes. I think JJ may get it back on track. Uh, I, I'm not as down on Star Wars as a, a lot of uh, the fandom seems to be with it. Um, but I think that's just because I'm not as closely married to it as, as a lot of people are. Um, and that's not a judgment one way or the other. I'm, I'm just saying, honestly, like Star Wars is something that I find fun, but it, it was never as important to me as Star, War, as Star Trek was. Fair. So, you know, I, that's one. That's what I am. I'm, I'm a red shirt. Fair. And uh, you see, I'm not. I, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I know. You, know, die <laughs> you do know. You do know. But I know. That, that's why I'm being very careful with my language. No, it's because okay. I, I don't I'm want not... to insult anybody, <laughs> least of all you. But I, I know that you wouldn't take it that way anyway. No, no not at all. And there is this thing called the fandom menace at the moment online. Where, <laughs> yeah. It's like the attack of the fans. And I'm just like, guys, listen, you know, it, it, this was bad since afford the force awakens you know i don't know why people yeah. just woke up woke up and said oh it's bad i'm like it was bad from the beginning <laughs> <laughs> no, i actually, had three really good movies and it's all been a bit iffy since iffy since then yeah look i really liked the last i i liked the last jedi because it was completely different to the force awakens mm. and then when everybody was like oh the last jedi is bad i'm like no it was just going this way because my big thing was it's like you know anyone who read the books um, see, actually, to be honest with you, like, yeah, the um, I Jedi is fantastic, and the Tron series is amazing. But even going back to when we got the big expanded universe boom after the prequels, I never really liked the stuff after Jedi because I'm like, well, we kind of already know what happens. Everything now after this is kind of filler. I always liked the stuff way in the past, so like Kotor <laughs> and all that stuff, and I thought that was. That would have been a much smarter thing for Disney to do, to just tell those stories, because nobody knows those stories, rather than going, well, do you want to see old Luke? Here's old Luke. You know, it's like, <laughs> nobody wants to see old Luke. You know, we've seen Luke's journey, you know, I don't know, crazy. Do you know, we reviewed a couple of um, Star Wars novels on Erie International recently, and the, the reason for it was, um, we wanted to do something to do with Star Wars. Right. Uh, we had um, Toby from Blue Milk Blues on uh, the show, uh, which is a German language Star Wars podcast. Oh, it has the best title of any Star Wars uh, podcast I've ever heard. I love it. And um, these two books, and for the life of me, my memory's terrible now. I can't remember anything. But it was based around this idea of a um, like a zombie virus that had been cultivated, and the Empire were going to use it to uh, try and gain an advantage somewhere in the universe. Um, and the first one that was written was set on a, a Star Destroyer. Um, and then the sequel was actually basically trying to uh, tap into the power of these runes that had been left on the planet hundreds of thousands of years beforehand. Um, and I wish I could remember. Death Troopers was the name of one of them. Yeah, I read Death um, Troopers. It was amazing. Oh, actually, Red Harvest. Red I, Harvest, I, I yes. Red Harvest thank you. Well, yeah. They would make amazing movies, like standalone Star Wars movies. I, why, why not make them? Seriously. Because here's the thing, you know, I actually read, now I actually t- didn't think I read Red Harvest, but then I'm like, oh yeah, I did actually. Um, I gave away my <laughs> copy of Death Troopers because someone else wanted to read it in Italy, and I'm like, thanks man, could have given it back ah. to me. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and I think, because a lot of the things that people have is like, oh, well, we don't have the iconography or you know, oh, like, well, you would. Those standalone stories kind of have everything. And what I think has been more successful, if you look at um, Rogue One, like Rogue One has a very tentative attachment to the Star Wars saga other than it has the Death Star and Vader's yeah. in it for a little bit. But the rest of it's kind of standalone. And I think that kind of proved that you can tell these side stories and the actually be more interesting than something we've already seen so i think mandalorian when that comes out that will also kind of do the same thing where it's like look it doesn't have to be focused on the skywalkers because 
mm. we know what happens there. It's a constant cycle. And even in the books, like I like Jake and, and um, Janet, uh, Janet and Jason Solo. But again, it was just the same. The same. You know, it's like, oh, he's Vader. Oh, no, we need yeah. to beat him now. Oh, he's actually good. You know, it's like, <laughs> come on, guys, no. Like, I, I remember thinking, like, before, he's Vader. Oh, no, we need yeah. to beat him now. Oh, he's actually good. You know, it's like, <laughs> come on, guys, no. Like, I, I remember thinking, like, before, the last Star Wars book that came out, I remember reading actively, was in one of the, it had a yellow cover, and it was like, Luke was going off on, old Luke was going off on a journey with his son, and I'm like, this is garbage. This is not good, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My brother-in-law told me about one that he read once, where um, Chewie gets crushed by a planet. Oh yes. Uh, which sounded f- like absolutely baller. Like that is the way to go. Uh, <laughs> have something interesting happen in your books. Like you know, it's one of these kind of things where you're sitting there and you're like, right, I like, I like bits of this, and I thought, you know, Disney buying it, they would, they would kind of sieve through it it'd be a filter but yeah. they don't they don't have that filter you know it's like the old um, Vince Russo Vince McMahon thing a lot of great ideas just no filter and Kathleen Kennedy is just not the right person to be running to be running Star Wars because she she's not a fan of it and Dave Filoni is a fan of it and I think he would actually be able to do like here's the thing as you said you know he took the worst episode uh, up until the new movies episode 2 took a chunk mm-hmm. out of it, which was kind of silly, and made one of the best pieces of Star Wars media out of it in the Clone Wars. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But, you know, it, it comes down to characterization, and, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff involved in, in getting that to work. And it takes a... I don't want to use the word visionary, because that sounds like I'm, I'm blowing his horn, but um, it takes somebody that does have vision, uh, if that's another way of putting it, um, to see um to see the potential of a property and and to kind of mine that potential and and use it to its best strength um so someone like that really would be a good choice to head up an entire department you look at kevin feige again just going back to that guy he knows how to tell a story he knows how to link stories together and he's done an amazing job of coordinating everything that's happened in the mcu just to bring it back around again. Yeah, but actually, before before we kind of switch topics a bit, with hmm. um, w- there's an interesting article that came out like two or three days ago, uh, and it, there's they've been dropping over the past couple of months, but one really came out like last week, and it's like yeah, uh, piracy is on the increase again because yeah, I mean look at all the Somalians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, digital piracy, Dave. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just being <laughs> an off. <laughs> <laughs> but it's on the increase because uh, of all these extra streaming sites. So piracy pretty much died because of Netflix and how easy it was and how everything was centralized. Mm-hmm. And now because, you know, in America, they have a bunch of different ones. Actually, in America, they launched a free one for IMDb. IMDb launched their own streaming service there like two mm-hmm. days ago. It's free, okay. yeah. So if you have a VPN in Ireland or in England, you can check it out and sign up. But um, there's just there's there's too many choices, and everything is split over now. And now pi- yeah. people are like, "Oh, I can just pirate this." So it's like, "Oh wow, good job, guys! You have now brought piracy <laughs> back when it was pretty much dead." This is the problem. It is because it's exactly like you say, and I heard Kevin Smith say exactly the same thing months and months ago. Um, whereas before we had a cable subscription, multiple channels, and it would cost, you know, like a hundred dollars or like upwards of, of up to a hundred pounds in this country. I know because I'm still paying for sky and God damn it, it's expensive. Um, rather than that, we did go to a system where, oh, well, Netflix has got a bit of everything. So just pay nine ninety nine a month or, you know, WWE network nine ninety nine a month mm-hmm. or uh, new Japan pro wrestling, 999 yen a month. And that's great when you're only paying for the one thing. But yeah. like you say, there are so many of them now and the entertainment is split over so many different channels that you end up essentially just paying a, a, the same as you would for a, a cable subscription to be able to watch all of these different varied services like DC and uh, Disney and Netflix and Amazon and IMDb have got a free one now. So like, I, I guess that's not 
adding to the problem per se. And then, you know, America has it terribly because they've got even more of these uh, services that you can uh, become a subscriber to that fortunately we don't have over here. And therefore, Titans was on Netflix as of like last week, which mm. is good for me because I was never going to pay to watch that. No, not um, a million years. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, just so, I just couldn't. No. No. So, so you know, it, it is a problem. And I wonder how long it's going to be until all of these different streaming services look at it and think to themselves, oh, hang on, we've caused a problem here. Let's try and do something about it. And whether that comes in the in the way of and, and this is not an example that I ever thought I would be drawing. But in the UK on, on Sky, on the 900 channels, uh, <laughs> there, there is adult programming. And if you subscribe for one Chirol or someone like that, and a bunch of these other so services came together, clubbed together, and said, do you know what? Pay £20 a month, and you'll get access to these five different content providers. I think that might be something that we see from the smaller ones going forward. I don't know how long it will be until the big ones feel the pinch, if ever. Mm. Um, but it's unsustainable. At the rate that it's going, it's it's not sustainable in the slightest. It's either, um, that, it's either that or else you just hope that Disney buys everything. And, and that's not good at all anyway. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> We've seen what they've done to, uh, to, to some franchises that people love. And... It's not always good. Um, competition is good, to Com borrow another uh, wrestling term. Um, competition is great. And here's the thing, though, Dave, you know, um, even to, to bring it back closer to home, like Article 13 now is going to be voted on in the next oh. seven or eight days. I know it doesn't, yep. doesn't really doesn't affect you, but uh, it's kind of scary for us uh, because we could see these streaming sites maybe being made inaccessible or something kind of being quashed down where content is blocked off and it, it's one of those kind of things where it's like right the fight now seems to be either the free market where as you say you come up with that solution is actually very good where you pay 20 bucks and you get access to three things or whatever you know where it's very consumer focused where if you start bringing in big business or big government it kind of squashes stuff down to the point where yeah you're left with very limited options or no options and because it's at the end of the day, especially with a, a digital streaming platform where your overheads are the same regardless, okay, streaming platform where your overheads are the same regardless. Okay, okay, if you if you have like an if you double the number of subscribers, you're going to have to put more servers into operation. Fine, but your your overheads largely don't change. So actually, having one third of something is better than having. 100% of nothing, you know? Oh, exactly. So th exactly. They need to look at it from a business point of view. Yeah, it's good for consumers, but it's good for them as well because they're getting one third of the pot of money that they otherwise wouldn't be getting any share of at all. And actually, um, here's a funny story. Yeah. Do you know why Netflix is more expensive than Amazon Prime? I haven't the foggiest, actually. Well, this is a really nerdy one, but we figured this out and work like two or three days ago. The real, Well, not two, a couple of weeks ago. The reason why is because... Amazon owns AWS. Their servers are AWS servers. Ah, uh, okay. Netflix runs on Amazon web servers. <laughs> 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 so there's no overhead for Amazon. They're just like, yeah, we'll just spin up a couple of boxes and away we go. So the extra three or four dollars you pay in Netflix is going straight, straight to Amazon for servers. So it's hilarious. Like. So you know, uh, until the divorce settlement comes through, Amazon haven't got any massive costs. Uh, <laughs> they're the, the most, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being serious here. Um, they make more profit than Apple. Yeah. Than Microsoft. They're, they're like the number one most profitable public. Is it a public organization? Yeah. I remember it's either public or private. It's public, yeah. Public, yeah. They're the number one most profit-making public organization in the world now, which to, is just mind-boggling. I have to hand it to them, though, when you actually understand, and I've said this to people as well, to people as well, because um, most people just think Amazon and think, oh, stuff that comes in post. Nobody actually thinks that Amazon means web servers. Because mm. nobody really... Yeah. nobody really, it's lost. Yeah, most people don't get how cloud computing, what cloud computing actually is or what the cloud actually is. Nobody kind of has pieces to get like general public. 
And you're like, yeah, you know, it's a big computer in a server firm <laughs> in America or in Germany or in Ireland or in England, you know. Uh, and that's yeah. what it is. And that's where Amazon would make all their money. So when you actually see how deep this rabbit hole goes and what's actually hosted on AWS servers, you're like, oh, well, no wonder they're making so much money. And actually, to be honest with you, their actual product, like AWS servers are fantastic. I personally use them myself um, mm. because they're great. But you can pretty much do whatever you want with them. And that's that's an example. Like, they're as you said, they're beating off uh, Apple. They beat Microsoft. They beat... Um, Google, Google, they're actually beating Google. Google have a very min- minimal impact in that market because, as you said, Dave, it's a good product. You know, it it's cheap. It's relative, well, relatively cheap, uh, and it's mm. quick and easy. And you know, competition competition is king here, and you know they prove it. But it's funny that you know when you're paying to Netflix, you're still giving money to Amazon. When you're paying to WWE, I guarantee they're probably running AWS as well. Um, you're giving money to Amazon. It's just like, well, you can't get away from it. Yeah. Poor Jeff Bezos. His wife is going to do very well. <laughs> oh, she's going to do brilliantly. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the cost of an Amazon subscription went up after the divorce comes through. Oh, yeah, that's something else. Because something else. That's half its tune gone. Yeah, man. It's what, 140 billion? For prenup, this wouldn't have happened in the first place. And that's a hell of a lot cheaper than, you know, 70 billion. But, so, um, Dave, let's let's switch gears here and talk about Steam. You're a you're a big video game nerd, obviously, like me. What are you playing at the moment? Are you are you still sticking on PC or have you diversed out to? Dave, let's let's switch gears here and talk about Steam. You're a you're a big video game nerd, obviously, like me. What are you playing at the moment? Are you are you still sticking on PC or have you diversed out to console gaming more and more? Uh. No, when when I have the time, I, I find that most of my actual gaming takes place on Steam. Um, okay. Football Manager 2019 was a recent purchase for me, and I've already ploughed a, a decent number of hours into that. Jeez, um, play. That's basically all I ever play on PC <laughs> is Football Manager. Really? Yeah. Oh, um, but then uh, PlayStation, this is the weird thing. I think my PS4 in the last calendar year spent more hours streaming uh, Netflix and YouTube than it did playing games. Um, See, here's what's, weird. A- here's what's weird about that. I did that with my PS3. I still use my PS3 mm-hmm. to this day to as a media center for Netflix. And stuff like that. But PS4, I actually find myself playing games on it more and streaming on it. But the thing about it is, I don't know if you found this or not, but I find games, modern games, very boring. And I don't know why. I think that the, I think this is a twofold problem. I think the first thing is that games have homogenized an awful lot. So most of the really big games tend to use very similar gameplay techniques. Um, I, ever since Grand Theft Auto 3 came out, the absolute money pot has been in open world games. And everyone who's anyone has tried to build themselves a open world game. Uh, every now and then you have a company come along who makes something like Journey, who, you know, absolute heroes making games like Journey because honestly gaming uh, at the moment is just short, sweet. It knows what it wants. It's focused. It's it's laser focused uh, and it takes you on the journey and it tells you the story you want that it wants to tell you. Um, but... I don't know, like Red Dead, I, I've been absolutely loving Red Dead 2. Um, I, I get where people have been saying that it's a bit boring for them because you're uh, traveling an awful lot rather than doing things. But here's the thing. It's replicating the Old West. And part of being in the Old West was you spent a lot of time traveling. So, you know, from that point of view, I, I think that they absolutely nailed it. There is mm. a way of fast travel traveling and it costs money and that makes perfect sense because if you wanted to get anywhere in a hurry in in the west then you had to pay money to do it so um i i think that red dead has gotten a lot of flack for stuff that it really didn't deserve to get flack for um that being said not played the online at all i'll be very surprised if i find anything in the online that keeps me at it in the same way that gta 5 online did right but yeah, I think that that's mainly it. And also the second reason, I, I was going somewhere with this, wasn't I? Um, mm-hmm. The second reason is just the fact that we're getting older and we've got more things to spend our time and our interests on and games 
every now and then lose their appeal. I guess so, uh, but, but Dave, so, yeah. on that point though, like you know, we'll talk, we'll get into retro pie in a, in a while, but you know, mm. I'm playing a lot of PS2 uh, games, and they actually had a lot of a lot of uh, homogeneity as well, as far as like you're playing Tony Hawk's Four. And you can, you yeah. know, it feels very much like playing Bully, you know, which is a fantastic game. It feels very much like playing GTA, GTA Three, but you know, like it has these same me- mechanics where you have to talk to someone and then do this, you know. But there's still enough inside that game mechanic where you're not bored. And I, mm. I, I know some people are like, oh, you know, old man, you know, going on nostalgia. It's like, <laughs> no, it's it's not like that. I mean, in the PS2, Xbox, there was enough there to keep you coming back you know there's enough there to to actually in the game itself you know i'm probably gonna play hit and run in a while mm. graphics in that game suck but it's a fun game you know it's uh, it actually there's enough in there that will keep you entertained however when i'm playing a modern ps4 game i play it and then i'm like well all right you know <laughs> it's like and i'm not you know if we were here you know bitching about Fortnite, fair enough um, uh, you know, then you could, you know, oh, back in my day, you could use those statements. But uh, even with the bigger releases, I find myself just sitting here going, "Well, okay," you know. Uh, it, it, there's nothing really to sink my teeth into. Nothing that keeps me engaged for long periods of time. Um, mm. and that's a shame. You know, it really is a shame because I'm I was expecting more from the PS4 than homogeneity. Uh, so, but then again, you know, a game like Spider Man comes out, and I'm like, oh well, this is unreal, and I, you know, ninety seven percent complete it or something like that in three days, or you know, Mortal Kombat, as we said, I'm like, oh, this is great, yeah. you know. I think it's just a case of gaming needs to really find its identity again, and its identity isn't, you know, these similar games like Watch Dogs, for example. Watch Dogs Two is a very good game, however. I was so burned by Watch Dogs, very good game. However, I was so burned by Watch Dogs 1 that I can't allow myself to get into it because, you know, I'm like, oh, I've been hurt before. I'm not going to be hurt I, again. Actually, you know, that was the last time I actually got excited for a game. Really? I'll be honest with you, yeah. It's the last time that I bought h- hype hook, line, mm-hmm. and sinker into a game was Watch Dogs. And I, ever since then, I'm like, no. <laughs> Never again. Well, I, I think also that there's another thing that is at play here, which has just kind of popped into my head. And I'm sure that this isn't an original sentiment. Someone has probably said this before, and I might even have heard them and, and taken it as my own idea. But if you think back to uh, when gaming was relatively new, you know, when, when we were younger and, and you had the, your NES and SNES and PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, gameplay wasn't always assured as being good or even, you know, okay some games were horrible and now i feel like every game that comes out from a gameplay perspective they're at the very least decent yeah and that means that the emphasis has moved away from we need to make a game that plays well and it's moved more towards we need to make a game that keeps people interested um and i think maybe that is where some of the problem is is because Either you need to make a game that is short, sharp to the point, or you need to make a game that has a story which keeps people coming back and keeps people interested. And not everybody is capable of doing that. I, um, you know, and that's the thing. But when you when you make a game to appeal to everybody, oh, it's it's like a phrase, you know, to use a wrestling uh, analogy. When all the moves are five stars, none of them are. You know. <laughs> And that's why I suppose when something like Fortnite comes out and I just don't get it because, you know, it looks silly. I think it's because, and because, you know, I, I don't know, I'm just not even going to try to, you know, I sound really old now, but I'm sorry. Um, but I just don't get it. And I think the reason why I don't get it is because it's popular. You know what I mean? Where it's like, it's so different to what's coming out now that it's able yeah. to be latched onto and appreciate in, in a way that's beyond our knowledge because we're we're that much older and we expect certain things in the game i think that's what it is yeah i i think fortnite is probably a good example of uh, the social media video game yes um exactly. which is something that we've exactly. seen with yeah uh, 
if you look again, just to um, go back to a game that I, I name dropped before, Grand Theft Auto Five Online, um, I became ridiculously obsessed with that game, not because it was good, because it is one of the grindiest games that you will ever play in your life, mm. um, but because all of my friends were playing it and we would just go online and we would just banter backwards and forth and do ridiculous things. And yeah, that that was us spent that that was our version of old guys down the pub you know yeah we're yeah. not spending time down the pub we're spending time on our consoles playing games being ridiculous um and Fortnite is the younger generation's version of that because mm-hmm. they've grown up uh in in the short term i mean you've got to remember that the, the kids that are playing that game they've got maybe three or four years of consciousness of video games before then mm-hmm. uh for, to, to, to some extent i mean obviously you've got older kids that are playing it as well but um let's just take a case in point let's say a 12 year a 12 year old right well they wouldn't have been playing video games and consciously kind of like you know because obviously they'll, they'll be playing on smartphones and stuff but at most i'd say they've probably got about between four and six years of experience of video games so mm. what are the big games that came out in those last few years we've got overwatch mm which is uh, a shooter, a competitive shooter. Um, and you've got Minecraft, which has just been constant in its uh, ability to appeal to people of all ages. I mean, I still play Minecraft from time to time. I find it quite relaxing. It's electronic uh, Lego. And, and what Fortnite has managed to do is they've taken the social aspect of GTA V online. They've taken the shooter mechanic of Overwatch, and they've managed to graft in the building of Minecraft and they formed this game, which is just the the perfect. Um, it's like the, the the eye of the storm of all of these things that kids are really going to get into, and it's no surprise that kids get addicted to it because the one thing above all else that when and any of us is when we were kids, the one thing that you never wanted to do was be left behind by your friends. Fair. And and Fair. that's what Fortnite does. You know, I think that's what it is. It, it's because for me when I play games despite the fact that I do like streaming um, mm. and sharing that actually playing games with people I don't like doing because I'm quite no. Ill. you know for me <laughs> for graphic, well, I'm the same <laughs> yeah yeah. For, from my gaming perspective I'm like I kind of just want to play the game <laughs> you know and just be left alone but you know I will play online with um, Star Wars Battlefront 2 I play that online quite a lot because it's fun yep. um, and I'm quite a fan of it despite all the, the controversies now actually the game that came out as it is now is actually the game that I think all wanted it to be initially. So they kind of got mm. there like two years late. But um, yeah, man, it's just, it's weird. You know, I, I find myself swapping between older games and, you know, my PS4. But even to the the 3DS, like I, you know, obviously come from a comp science background. So I learned to hack the, the PS3, the, not the PS3, the, the 3DS. And um, mm. it's, yeah. It's okay, you know. Some of the games are okay. Not that we endorse hacking consoles or anything like that, but you know, whatever. Um, educational purposes. Uh, <laughs> I did actually learn to do it in my university, so it is kind of funny. So it counts. <laughs> um, you know, and you're playing some games. You're like, okay, you know, whatever. You know, I I hmm. pick up one or two games. I uh, I bought Zelda and stuff like that, and I was like, okay, this is fun. But um, st- even still, it can't hold my attention. But uh. In the same vein, going back to you know the PS2 and then going back further to the retro play, this is why we're seeing, mm. particularly in people in our age group, we're seeing this re- renaissance um, of interest in it. You know, like uh, I used to work with guys who every week, every week they would sit down and play fifty to hundred games of Street Fighter Two. Yeah. Every week, yeah, it, it and they still obsessive. do. They still do, you know, <laughs> and, and they love it, you know. And it's like that's it, you know. On on on, they used to do it on the Super Nintendo, and then I, uh, you know, told them about Retro Pie, and they're like, oh my god, you know, we can just do this straight off, you know, we don't have to bring all this kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, man. Mm. So you yeah, know, that, that's kind of what you're saying. It's like you know, instead of going to the pub, they were playing Street Fighter, you know. And what is this? And I, I am conscious of the time, so you know. If, you know, instead of going to the pub, they were playing Street Fighter, you know. And what is this? And I, I am conscious of the time. So, you know, for Phoenix mm. FM listeners, go over to uh, Nerd to Know Media 
dot com and you'll be able to get the rest of the show and there's links to our iTunes feeds and stuff like that as well. So if we go over, which we will, um, that's where <laughs> we're going. So um, yeah, Dave, what do you think? Where do you think this comes from? This 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 retro revival in such a way. I I think it's always been there. I think the technology has just caught up to the point now that we're able to indulge in it more. Um, because you know, if if you think back to how um, emulation and and retro gaming has always been up until, and I'm just going to ballpark a figure in here and, and say two or three years ago, mm. it was the preserve of people that were willing to have a, a computer that wasn't necessarily dedicated to it, right. but certainly there were inherent risks involved in emulating and downloading ROMs uh, on, on a Windows PC, certainly. Um and, and, you know, it wasn't something that a lot of people even knew you could do. Yeah. And then suddenly out of nowhere, Raspberry Pi comes along. And initially, Raspberry Pi wasn't something that people thought, oh, we could emulate stuff on that because it just it wasn't quite powerful enough. Maybe for the 8-bit generation, but other than that, there wasn't really anything there. Um, and then the first I remember hearing about it was uh, watching an episode of Retro Man Cave right. where – he managed to graft a Raspberry Pi 3 into a Game Gear. And I was just like, hello, what's this? <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, as soon as you start looking into it, you see that there's this entire um, world that you, you uh, hitherto did not know about, which is emulation, whether it's through um, cracking your PSP or your PS Vita or the 3DS um, whether it's installing it on uh, an old computer like uh, a, a Dell um, computer, like the, the ones that you can buy for like 20 bucks off of eBay, mm. um, or whether it's uh, buying a custom PCB board like a RetroPi, not RetroPi, sorry, a Raspberry Pi, and installing firmware that allows you to download ROMs and play them directly off of the device. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's just that, it's opportunity more than anything. A lot of the makers like Nintendo have come along and said, oh, hang on, there's a market for retro games. And they've identified that firstly because there's more buzz about it on the internet, but secondly because they did put their original catalog of games out on Wii or Wii U it was, and they saw a decent number of downloads for it. And so they thought, but, okay, let's do this. So they made a retro NES yeah, and the, the, that sold well. The and then the is, SNES. The thing of it is though, you know, with the retro consoles and, you know, the emulation going back where you could buy, you know, games for like five euros or whatever. That's what it was over here. Five euros for Gradius. Yeah. Oh, I like Gradius a lot, actually. It's one of my favorite NES games. It's not worth five euros, you know, <laughs> like a digital <laughs> download is not worth it. But I, I still think they haven't copped on to the actual price. But then again, if you buy a cartridge copy of Gradius, it's going to cost you 20, 20 euros. Hmm. You know, uh, if you go buy it in one of the second-hand stores or on eBay or something like that, but I still but think we're in this weird situation where we went from you could go onto websites and you could pull ROMs, pull ROMs, yeah. And was that right? No, I mean it, it's a legal but, gray area, yeah, isn't it? Because like, you are allowed to have digital backup copies of media that you own, and and that is enshrined in law, as far as I'm aware. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, making those copies available freely on the internet is probably not legal and not good because it is essentially piracy. But then again, there's there's another aspect which complicates things, which is these games, there is a finite number of them, and Nintendo up until recently weren't going to be profiting from those games yeah. at all. And so if there is no revenue to be taken from them, then what's the harm in people enjoying them um, off of the internet, you know, or buying them secondhand? I just want, uh, to, just want to put a pin in it there, Dave, while, while, we, yeah. while we go into the, the Phoenix FM end of the show. So uh, before we, we wrap up the show here, Dave, where can the good people of Ireland reach you? Ah, well, I'm on Twitter at Real Dave Roberts. Uh, you can also search on iTunes and on Google Play Podcasts for Eerie International, which is a horror podcast with my friends David and Andy, and also Generation Animation, which is an animation review podcast with uh, a, a revolving cast, including Tyler and uh, Mark and Bianca 
and Felipe and myself, of course. So, yeah, those are the main places that you'll find me. All right. And, uh, guys, we are going to keep going for the next uh, 15 minutes over on nerdtoknowmedia.com, iTunes, all that kind of places. Radio's done, <laughs> but uh, they, you know, you you made some really good points, and on that, you know, and I do have to say, do you have a, a NES Classic, or do you have a PS Classic, or, or did you bother with any of those systems? No, I was tempted, but then I looked at the range of games that are available mm. and the price of the consoles, and I just thought, you know what, for me personally, it's really not worth it. Um, it's especially when you look at the fact that the PlayStation Classic, which apparently was really poorly implemented, the only games on there that I would want to play, I already own and have the means to play uh, via the original discs and the consoles that uh, are needed to play them. Well, um, well here's what's funny, right? Uh, I was I was up in Belfast there before Christmas, and uh, we were looking around, and you know I saw that the the PlayStation Classic went from you know a hundred. <laughs> you know, yeah. down to sixty, and you know, I saw that the the PlayStation Classic went from, you know, a hundred, you know, <laughs> yeah. down to sixty, and down to fifty. I'm like, what is this? You know, <laughs> and you know, and they're like, okay, I, I wouldn't pick it up. But the actual like innards of the console itself, you can get for three euros on iTunes on a uh, Google Play because it's um, what well, I think it's the PS the PSX. I was going to find the actual emulator because it's here. I have it on my phone. It's the EPSXE. That's the emulator to use. So it's an open source emulator that they're using for it. Now, I did find a really good usage for it. Mm. Um, if you watch on YouTube, you can see some people. They've actually taken um, the the body of the PS Classic yes. and cut it out and put a Raspberry Pi in. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen that. And I'm like, that was really well done. <laughs> that was really well done. And I'm like, this is actually quite cool. However, um, on Twitter, people can follow me on Twitter. They can see uh, my own little project there was the similar kind of thing with the Mega Drive. Now, I didn't get an S Classic because I'm not a Nintendo fanboy. I, you, know, you know, I like Nintendo, but, you know, Mega Drive and Sega is where my heart yeah. is. You know, I, ideally, I'd love to work for Sega, you know, someday. But um, or do something for Sega. You don't even work for Sega. Just release a Dreamcast game or finish the Mega Drive game I'm making. You know, a game that's actually difficult for people to play, as far as because it is on an old, an old console. But anyway, um, you know that's where my heart lies. So I was like, okay, I was going through, and then I saw that you can actually just buy these cases, where yeah. it will make your Raspberry Pi look like a Mega Drive, and you know. It's pretty amazing. Like uh, the one that I posted on your controllers or your your hard drive or whatever, and it works great. It's a it's a fantastic system, and I think the only re- how I justify that because this is all a legal gray area, you know. Mm. Sega haven't done this. <laughs> no, that's you know, very true. <laughs> I just don't understand it. I'm like, guys, if you release this and even had you know put a uh, Christian Whitehead in charge of cultivating song Sega fan games, mm. you'd make. A buttload of cash, you know. So absolutely, you know. And the thing about it is, most of Sega's games are all proprietary, so they're not third party. So there's no licensing issues like there would be with PlayStation, which is, I believe, why the selection of games are so poor. But if you pick up the 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 Mega Drive thing, let's just say, right, so you can run through it. All the Streets of Rage games, you know, Golden Axe, Kid Chameleon, all the Sonic games, and then you know. Well, what about the fan games? If you had a section of fan games, remember Christian Whitehead, the guy who did um, Sonic Mania, he got started because he actually made all these fan games. The, the Sonic community and the Sega community make ROM hacks and make current games even to this day. And I just don't know why they didn't do this, you know, because I actually went looking for a Mega Drive Mini or whatever. And they exist in Argus and stuff, but they're absolute hot garbage. Yeah. <laughs> So I I'm think not... um, Sorry, part, part, of the, part of the reason might be just to the fact that um, Sega have not had very good luck with um, hardware 
in recent years and they've always had more success with software which is why there is a mega drive collection on steam yeah but there is no classic mega drive available yeah um and more success with software which is why there is a mega drive collection on steam yeah but there is no classic mega drive available yeah um I, I think it's just an, an overhead that they don't see any need to spend. Oh yeah, when look, I, I, they I, could I, just put it out there on PC. I totally understand it. You know, like the but the fact is, particularly over here uh, in the UK and Ireland, you know, the things that we have more attachments to than the US would be the ZX Spectrum and the Sega Mega Drive, solely yeah. because they had much more of an impact over here. Mm, mm. You know, I remember. You know, nobody had a super, nobody had a NES in Ireland. So, <laughs> nobody had very few people had Super Nintendo, and they were the weirdos. You know, they're like, oh, you know, "What's wrong with you, man? Why don't you have your Sega?" You know, um, it was much more than in the UK. I have to say. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. But in, in Ireland, in particular, it was just like, no, it was I even mean, had a Sega. You know, it just wasn't it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and there is that kind of dead loyalty where people are like we love the mega drive you know so um yeah uh, you know it's like in australia (laughs) probably yeah yeah it's just it's just weird how it kind of worked out it must be a colonial thing but uh, (laughs) oh no the the australians are much more about whether you drive a a ford or a um uh whatever the the gm mark over there is i can't remember holden that's it but there are families that fall apart because one of them has bought the wrong car. Oh Jesus! <laughs> well, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> but uh, you know, for anyone who wants you to pick, say that now. <laughs> if for anyone who wants to pick it up, you know, you can go on Amazon and look for a Mega Pie case, and it's, it's a beautiful system. Like Dave, uh, you know, you're asking, does it come with a fan? There's one way you can get a fan and you can pop it inside. But I use, and it's great, man. You know, you pop it in and it's good to go, and the little reset button works, and you can, you know, obviously if you're if you're anyway, it's a Linux system, Raspberry Pi, so you can, you know, put in scripts for it to do X, Y, and Z, and I think it's great. Yeah. And I'm just, you know, I'm sad because I'm like, right, Sega did it because sorry, uh, Sony did it because they're money hungry, mm. and Nintendo did it because you know they saw a gap in the market, and Sega did it didn't do it because they can't do it or because they just don't see the point in it. And I'm just like, well, you know, if you guys aren't going to do it, right, well, you know. Mm. It goes back to the piracy <laughs> question. If something is made available for somebody, uh, yeah. they're 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 going they're not going to um, they're not going to take the long way. But it's just easier to get this system in a way that is much more appealing. And to be fair, I would want the PlayStation Classic because you know I have a PS3 that plays P- PS1 games. I have a, a a PSP which plays PS1 games. You know, so it's just yeah. but uh, having um, the retro play there is. You know, it is what it is, and I'd recommend it. But um... for me, it was a case of um, I in my loft. I have a SNES, which at the time was bundled with uh, Super Mario All Stars plus Super Mario World. So it's basically the entire collection of Mario games up until that point. Oh, the right. platforms. The problem is, I can't find the cartridge anywhere, and I definitely didn't sell the bugger. So I I don't know where it's gone, but I do own it. And so, therefore, I have no problem in downloading those games and putting them on the the Pi because I'm just like, it's basically just a digital copy of what I already own. You know, same with uh, Legend of Zelda and International Superstar Soccer, uh, games like that, yeah, well, because here, it's just easier to have it in one bundle. Well, here's a funny story for you, a true story, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how I got into console modding and actually how I ended up getting into computers pretty hardcore was purely by accident. So... I bought a, a PSP Go. Cause I love the PSP Go. Uh, I love, I, yeah, I love the design of it. I think it's great. You know, and obviously, cool. yeah, like it, it failed obviously because it got rid of the UMD and stuff like that. But in principle, it's great. You know, you get your mm. game. It's on the di- it's on the hard drive. Happy days. It's on the SD. Ahead of their time, really. Like if they release something like that now, then they'd be much closer to the the time that it would have worked. Because oh, yeah. you know they were talking oh, yeah. about getting rid of physical media mm. and that's not something that really was supported by uh, any kind of infrastructure until the last few years exactly exactly you know so i picked one up about three or four years ago right and you know set it up happy days got it for 60 quid it was grand had a couple of games on it you know um and i had those games physically right 
So I rang up, I rang up uh, Sega, and I was like, "Hey, look, I bought this. Um, I have the games physically. They're on the, di- they're already on this. Can you unlock it?" No, but I have the games already. I bought them several times. Yeah, but you know that was somebody else's account. You know, nothing we can do. Then I'm like, "Okay," and the rest was history. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it's stuff like that where it's just like, right, I've already given the money here. You guys aren't being helpful at all. It would literally be two clicks of a button. And I'm just like, okay, well, it is what it is. You know? This, uh, this is why, you know, PC gaming is as uh, good as it is because of the fact that when you've got something like Steam and, you know, people have different opinions on Steam, but still, you buy that game once. And as long as you can remember your login, you can install that game on as many computers as you want. Mm. and you'll never have to worry exactly. and if you want to you can lend them to friends like they 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 get it they absolutely get it and GLG and... are the same mm. Mm. same thing you know it's just it's yeah. it, it, look it's a new world that that we're in and it's a world that needs to have these built in changes and if they're not there you're going to get left behind and it's weird just like with uh, Netflix and the splintering of splinter, uh, streaming service you know how you stop piracy is not by banning stuff is not by bringing in government regulations. It's by making it so easy to not pirate that you won't be yep. bothered pulling up uTorrent. <laughs> People will pay for stuff if you make it easy enough for them and the right price. It has to be the right price still. If um, it's cheap and easy, you know, it will always win. Yeah. Here's the thing. Cheap and easy will always beat out two things. It will beat out piracy and sadly also security because people, if it's easy and cheap, people don't care. Because <laughs> so, we're human. I mean, we're human. Case in point, we reviewed a 1964 Giallo movie, um, Italian horror movie, last week on Erie International uh, called Blood and Black Lace. And that is not a movie you're going to find very easily. But I went on YouTube and I typed it in thinking maybe somebody just threw it on YouTube, you know, because what the hell, why not? And it came up as one of the films that was available for rental through Google Play and through YouTube. So well, I just paid my one ninety nine and I watched the movie. That's a prime example of what you're talking about there is make it easy, make it cheap, and people will just buy the product. Um, It's just, you know, the the only reason I even started looking on YouTube was because I was like, nobody in their right minds is going to stock a 1964 Giallo movie. There's no way. So, and then YouTube had it. And the same is true of anything. Like, I think that if you were to put up some kind of digital marketplace for retro games uh, like Nintendo, Sega, Atari, um, Amiga, Spectrum, all of that stuff, and you capped the price of the games up to, like, I don't know, 16-bit generation at one ninety nine a game, yeah. you would sell an absolute crap ton of games. Well, no the, problem whatsoever. It, it's It's been shown by these... Um... You know, by even GameStop getting in on it in the States and some parts of England where you can buy these games and then, like, specialty stores. Like, retro gaming is not... It has its base. It's just, you know, charging 150 for a cart is ridiculous. So we need yeah. to kind of... And 